Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for attending this online forum. I hope we will walk away with something that can help us uh, with our daily work to better assist um, domestic and family violence clients. My name is Adol Tekpini, and I am from the Department of Communities and Justice, specifically from Diversity Services. I would like to start by acknowledging that we are on Aboriginal land, pay our respect to elders, uh, past, present, and future, and give uh, thanks to people of the First Nation on which we are living and working. This land was and always will be Aboriginal land. I would also like to acknowledge any uh, of our, my Aboriginal colleagues who are here with us today. <clears throat> um, my acknowledgement also goes to all the frontline workers and their amazing work they have been doing during these difficult um, COVID period times. Um, health professional, police, teachers, and everybody who is working um, in the frontline service delivery, as well as you working from home, has been doing an amazing job to ensure that um, service delivery to um, clients of domestic violence are intact. So um, today, Susan Spencer is here to co-host um, this webinar with me. And Susan is the chair of the Lower North Shore Domestic Violence Network. I also have Maria from uh, Maria Comino from Relationship Australia, and she is also here to assist us and specifically with the questions. And so she will be um, ensuring that all the questions that you'll be asking today in the chat box are um, related to the speakers. Today we will have seven speakers from the services in New South Wales that work with um, victims. Uh, or yeah, with clients of domestic violence in different capacities. There will be a limited chance to converse with, um, with the speakers and ask questions as we have um, more than 200 participants in, in attendance today. Saying that, please um, use the box, um, the chat box on your top screen to ask questions and we'll try our best to answer some of these questions and the rest will be forwarded to the right speakers to answer those questions. Please try to write short direct questions so we can utilize our time efficiently. Uh, we would also like to thank everybody who have submitted questions uh, when registering for the webinars and acknowledge that uh, there were quite a few questions of more of a general nature that will not be addressed here, given that we are um, specifically trying to address COVID related issues. And so we are looking at possibility of future education opportunities or um, training where some of your questions can really be addressed. Please remember to mute yourself uh, just to minimize uh, background noise. And also keep a, uh, an eye on the chat box because we will be uh, putting a feedback survey uh, for you to complete. This will also be emailed to you um, after the, the webinar. As we all know, uh, there have been uncertain um, uncertainties due to COVID-19, uh, especially for service providers when it comes to service delivery and clients were hugely impacted due to these uncertainties and changes. A lot of people were uh, left with many questions and we are hoping today can uh, provide some clarity around, uh, around that and try our best to answer some of your concerns. I uh, want to thank our presenters uh, who gave up their valuable time to be here with us today to provide some update and information included in our panel are representatives from the New South Wales uh, local courts. Uh, we have Women uh, Domestic Court Advocacy Services, New South Wales Police Force, Legal Aid New South Wales, um, New South Wales DVD line, as well as Health New South Wales. This webinar is um, a collaboration between Communities and Justice and Relationship Australia and the Lower North Shore Domestic Violence Network. And so I would really like to um, thank Susan, Spencer and Maria Comino who have been really um, great in ensuring that we're doing this together. Um, so it has been a really good combined effort. 
So we will start our discussion with a representative from the New South Wales Local Court. And today it's my pleasure to introduce Erin Evans. And Erin is the registrar um, in Manly Local Court. Thank you, Erin, for being with us today. So Erin, what is the current situation regarding domestic violence matters uh, being heard at court? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, firstly, I wanted to acknowledge that we're on Aboriginal land and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and future. And I also want to acknowledge any Aboriginal colleagues who are with us here today. Um, so in regards to the current matter before the court, um, earlier this year, defended hearings that were listed between the March and July period were abandoned due to the pandemic. So um, at the beginning of this month, the Ch Chief Magistrate released further directions in respect of domestic violence matters indicating that they were the next uh, matter of priority for the courts. So from the 22nd of June, all domestic violence matters that were abandoned earlier in the year during that March and July period are now currently being relisted for a status mention, which is a mention date before the court where um, the defendant will indicate whether they're still maintaining their plea of not guilty or whether they are... Um, going to change their plea in any way. So if it's still a plea of not guilty or they're contesting or disagreeing with the AVO, then that matter will be fixed for a hearing date in the coming weeks, which we should start to hear defendant hearings now from July this year. All other matters that didn't fall within that period and are still awaiting hearing will be set for um, hearing following the conclusion of those status mentions. Great. Thank you very much for answering that. With the ease of um, restrictions, are the victims and support people now able to attend court or is this still happening online? So the Chief Magistrate's been pretty clear that attendance of victims or persons in need of protection are not required to attend court at this time unless the matter is fixed for hearing. So because we don't have any hearings currently, um, persons in need of protection aren't required at this stage, but as we start to hear uh, get hearings listed in the, in the coming months, then obviously they will be quite required. Um, and I'll also say that there are exceptional circumstances. So if a victim should need to attend court, then the majority of our safe rooms, our domestic violence safe rooms, are still operational um, for most courts. Um, but we have to ensure that we're still complying with social distancing requirements in all of our rooms in the court. But our main preference, wherever possible, is that if services can be provided offline or elsewhere, that's best rather than at court, but our doors are still open for victims if needed. Um, in relation to support people, the legislation has recently changed, um, which permits the uh, any person who is a party to a proceeding to bring two people to court with them to support people so that a family member or a relative or a friend, um, they can come to court with them as a support person. Um, so from 15 June, which was Monday, just gone, any of those support people can attend someone coming to court. Um, that's separate from WV, DV, CAS and, and those support services. So this is in respect of um, individual people bringing a couple of uh, people along. Um, I'll also note that some local arrangements underway within local courts in respect of support services like WDV CAS. Um, not all courts have these support services back, so it's important to get in contact with us if you um, are wanting to speak to any of our support services before you actually attend, and um, we can point you in the right direction if our support services are not back yet. It's good to know that um, people attending court have that support. I guess my next question is also in relation to, um, you know, the ease of restrictions. So uh, we understand it was, it must have been a bit, you know, took a bit of time to transition to online services, but now we just wanted to know what are the challenges for, um, for transitions or for future transitions as the restrictions are, are getting easier and easier now? Yeah, and I think COVID has posed many challenges for many agencies across the board. So we're aware that, you know, things are a little bit stressful and, and people are under a lot of pressure at the moment. So, and that's not any different from us as well. We've had a few challenges and, and most of them have been in relation to the restrictions of um, physical distancing. So I think the main point for us is to ensure that we're still meeting those requirements of um, social distancing and physical distancing in registries. Um, we've got a maximum number of people that can be allowed in the building 
and that is also for each part of the building as well. So the foyer has a max, the court courtrooms have a max, as well as our interview rooms and safe room as well. So signage has been placed up on all of the locations in each court and we've also included signs on chairs for where people should and shouldn't sit. So that's pretty clear um, when people are entering the court. Um, we've also attempted to minimise risk uh, and we have recently employed additional cleaning services throughout the registry. So we have someone there on site each day. Uh, and we've also installed hand sanitizers uh, around the building so that we've got that facility there for our clients. At Manly specifically, we're lucky that all of our interview rooms and safe room has been able to remain open as they're compliant with physical distancing, um, but some courthouses have had to shut some rooms. So it's important if you want to attend and you need a specific room to contact your registry before you attend. Um, and the last thing I think to mention is that just recently the Court Security Act was temp temporarily amended to authorise sheriff officers to take people's temperature um, in all courts around New South Wales. So that means when you're entering the court building, the sheriff officer will ask a couple of mandatory questions uh, and take your temperature before you enter the building to ensure that you um, do not have a fever um, and that you're not unwell before entering. This will pose some challenges in people queuing outside and there may be some delay, but, um, you know, we're paramount the safety of our clients and staff is paramount so having that service there from the sheriff is um really benefit us all and it will help keep everyone safe great thank you for answering that my final question to you is in relation to the um apprehended um apvo um and so what is the current process for applying for an apvo are um, the courts able to hear these matters yet? And just to start by explaining what an APVO is. Yeah, sure. Uh, so an APVO is an apprehended personal violence order. So this is a um, application that someone will make generally for someone that they're not related to. So um, if an incident has occurred, then you can come to the court and take out this application against this person that you're not related to. Um, it's separate from an ADVO and that ADVO is taken out by the police um, and that's generally where there's been a domestic relationship. Um, so as to the process, the process hasn't changed um, throughout the pandemic. Um, any party is still able to come and apply for an APVO and they have been able to the last few months and it is listed before the court. There was a slight change in procedure where the magistrate would look at every APVO um, and see if an interim order is required. but. Um, moving forward, APVOs will, will be in the same way um, and the police will continue to take out their ADVOs as well. Um, the, if Once the application is um, received, if we need to get in contact with that person at all, we'll take down email address and phone number just in case the registrar will need to discuss any part of their application for them, uh, with them, sorry, before it's listed before court. Um, and separately, I just wanted to note that we strongly encourage parties, any person that has had an incident with someone in a domestic, with a domestic relationship or someone that they don't know to contact the police if they're in fear for their safety, or you can contact um, one of the other services like WDV CAS or the Domestic Violence Helpline um, if there's been any uh, issues in that way. So it's especially, it's especially important for you know, the safety of those people that they're, they're doing that. Um, and I'll also mention that the, the court is more than happy to have any query, if anyone has any queries or concerns, the court is more than happy to answer those as well through email or through phone call. And um, at the moment, you know, we're still happy to receive people in person if needed, just making sure that they call ahead. Great. Thank you very much. That was our final question for you. I'll just leave that to... Um I'll open the floor for questions. So Maria, if you um, can come along and just um, read for us any questions from the audience. Thank you. Thanks, Adol. Thank you. Maria, just to um, ask any or provide any questions that has been, you know, put on through the chat. Maria? Maria Camino? Hello, there we go. That might be better. Oh, thanks, Adola. Uh, there are a couple of questions that came through. Um, one was, uh, do the support people include WDV CAS workers or are they already there and part of the people who are present? Uh, no, so the support people are, are 
you know, friends, relatives, family, um, that those are the people that that was indicating to. Some WDB has support services have returned already, though, so they may already be at your local court registry. But the, the main point of the two support people was really for the defendant or the victim or whoever it might be to bring along a family member or, or a support person with them to court. Thank you. Uh, and the other question that came through was um, someone had a situation where an ADVO was wiped out when it was not meant to be because of not attending court. Uh, is there a, a way of overturning that situation? Yeah, I mean, in, in any of those situations, it's best just to contact the registry by email or by phone um, as soon as you can so that the registry can have a look into why that's happened or what the circumstances are. Um, if, if it's a case where, you know, there was a missed email or a missed um, phone call, we can certainly get those papers out and get them before a magistrate to have a look at so that we can investigate and follow up with the client. Thank you so much. No worries. No more questions? It's been covered. All right, great. Um, I, I just, so I'll, I'll hand this to you to introduce our next speaker, Susan. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'd now like to introduce Josie Gregory from the Women's Domestic Violence Court Advocacy Services, um, or WDV CAS. Uh, and thanks, Josie, for joining us today. Um, and uh, we've got a number of questions that people have been asking. And I guess the first one would be, what is the current impact of COVID-19 on the services provided by WDV CAS? Uh, and what's been the most significant change? Okay, uh, before I start, I want to acknowledge that we are on Aboriginal land and pay my respects to, to all elders past, present and future. Um, there's been lots of challenges for the service, but We've been doing very well with the clients. The significant change for us was not attending court and uh, managing the stands virtually, which we've done very well. Um, also, we have been lucky to have our lawyers there, so they have been able to give advice or represent women, but they haven't. Those clients haven't been able to see the client, the lawyer, face to face. Um, so that's been another challenge. The impact on our clients is we've seen there's more, more women are reporting sexual assault. We have more victims on visas. Um, we have an increase in older women, which many of them are homeless. There has been a lot more parent children abuse, you know, children or young adults struggling to get out or are playing their games and that sort of stuff. Um, I feel women are, are very, very isolated, very hard to talk to them whether a kid One woman had to uh, stop. Can I go on? Yes, please go on. Okay. One woman had to spell out, spell out what she was saying to one of our workers saying, uh, I had to spell out L-I-C-E because you HIT me, you know, stuff like that. Um, it's a big challenge too for workers because some of them are living in small flats with the other party that's um, also working from home. So it's been quite hard. We've made a lot more child protection reports. The fax docs, or what do you call that? CJ, whatever they call now. Um, the delay in court, there's been so many delays in court. For many women, that seems to minimize the importance of what is happening to them at this stage. Um, it takes much longer for us to give a woman a result about the matter at court. Um, and we found that a lot less women are seeking for separation and parenting orders. And less women are seeking alternate or refuge accommodation. Some are still doing that. But I think a lot of them are sort of um, staying and trying to manage this situation at home for now. What do you think the most significant change has been? Uh, the most significant change? Not, not seeing, 
women face to face, not physically face to face, not attending court. Um, I think, yeah, but yeah, that the yeah, that's the for us that's the most the most significant one. I think. And, and do you feel that that's been a negative impact? <clears throat> it's obviously been negative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what do you think from the point of view of uh, being the central referral point um, and how is that being managed at the moment? That's been managed really, really well. We have a fantastic team. So they've all worked from home. They've worked down doing all the calls. Um, with a lot of them, it makes it, as I said, it makes it hard for the women to talk to, to clients when they're home and they're stuck at home. Um, you can often sense they told me often sense that the victim will say things like yes yes i'm fine everything is okay no i don't need support but you know you get this feeling that somebody else is around um so there was an in we had an increase of police referrals in march and april but it's it's come it's all right now but we have lots of referrals from hospital and agencies and we've managed really well yeah great uh, and what about the SAMs, the safety action meetings? How are they being managed at the moment? I'm surprised, but they've been fantastic. It was hard at the beginning because um, uh, we had to do it virtually. So um, all participants you know, had different ways they can do it. Some by phone, some can use Zoom, some um, can use WebEx, but um, our two SAM coordinators are fantastic at um doing stuff and technology so it, it's it was slow at first and it, they've struggled to get everybody on at the time but once that happened the safety action meeting went very well uh, all partic participants are very committed um uh, so that was the challenge is getting them on different on different in a different format um the process was kept to, um, I personally don't think it meets, it beats meeting participants face to face, but it's, it's gone really well. Yeah, great. Okay, um, we're also interested in the impact on the call community and we're just wondering what sort of support and resources uh, are out there for the call communities who might experience um, these sorts of bar barriers because of language or culture. Well, our service has a multicultural specialist worker that we've always had in our team. She's also the statewide uh, multicultural specialist for the whole program, the whole of the oh, government. Right. So she's in touch with all the call services. She brings back anything that happens at their network. Uh, we do have flyers in many languages, but very hard to send or email those unless you know the client says, yes, you can do that. Uh, we've used interpreters over the phone uh, to talk to a lot of these clients. Um, we've all got training in working with Cal community, so you know, and Aboriginal communities. So it's been easy. But having that that a Cal worker in our team has been a really good help. Uh, Forty, I think forty percent of our clients are from a Cal background. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what thanks for that. what do you see the biggest challenges going forward i guess you know as things are starting to shift back what do you see the diff problems are going to be for your service for our service i think getting those women back at court is going to be a difficult thing because wbcas thinks it's really important for women to attend court and empowered by what they're doing and seeing as a lawyer, solicitor, face-to-face, -face, often, you know, they can employ that lawyer on a grant or if they can pay him for their family law stuff. So I think that's going to be a, a, a big challenge to get them there. And also really important for them to see some of the DVLO, the DVLOs face-to-face. -face. Um, and a lot of the work is going to be a huge challenge going back to the office. Thanks for that. Um, Maria, have we got some extra questions for uh, Josie? Uh, not at this point. Okay, but all right. But so yes. thanks so much, Josie. That's fantastic. Thank you.
You're welcome. You mute your doll. Um, we'll just ask the next presenter to come along and we'll have um, uh, someone from police. Uh, at this time, I would like to introduce Senior Constable Alana Jemison from New South Wales Police uh, Headquarters, and she will give us some update from a uh, police perspective to domestic and family violence. So, um, good afternoon, Senior Constable. Um, uh, thank you for having for coming along and uh, just I'll start by asking you the first question. Uh, can you please uh, give us a quick update on COVID-19 and the domestic family violence currently uh, from a police perspective? Has there uh, been an increased rates across most suburbs in North Sydney, uh, in the North Sydney area? And what suburbs are those, if I may ask? Okay, firstly, I just want to acknowledge the Aboriginal people of this land and pay my respects to those past, present and future, and certainly those that are online with us today. Um, one simple thing I wanted to say during the current climate, it's been challenging for all of us, um, all of uh, the services that are online today and certainly for police as well. And I just want to acknowledge the hard work that's been put in during this time. It is for a short time, but I think we've done a lot of learnings through this time. We could probably follow through with a lot of those learnings as well. Um, it's been challenging for victims, survivors, police, everyone. So um, well done, we've done a good job. So to talk to the question about um, DV and COVID-19, just a quick update. I have made quite a few notes, so I wanted to make sure that I get that across to all of you here today. Um, essentially for police, we've had business as usual as, as a policing aspect. Um, we've certainly had some changes to do with our own safety, um, temperature testing. We've had quite a few close calls with police whenever we've been sped on and things like that. We've had to get testing and that requires a police officer off the road. So and, um, as it affects our frontline services slightly, things are now starting to ease. Um, we do acknowledge that the current isolation restrictions that were in place uh, or that they're starting to ease slightly would have certainly had an effect on the dynamics of a relationship, um, especially in terms of future risk or further risk and, and risk while in that home environment. We're constantly reminded of our own safety when dealing with people um, of all natures. You've certainly seen the, um, the news recently um, displayed. Um, I can tell you from first-hand experience that is a common theme. Um, I'm surprised that you're able to see first-hand exactly what we deal with. Um, and that's quite an emotional thing for all police to watch that, even though we weren't part of that. Um, our primary aim has always been and will continue to be maximise the effectiveness of every police inter um, intervention when it comes to domestic and family violence, maximise the support as much as we possibly can, hence CRP and the um, safety action meetings that we attend, which we've made work as best as we possibly could. Um, minimising the risk of harm to victims for re-offending and where we can prevent, um, be proactive in that approach. And that enables uh, that, that works on a two-way street with our services like yourselves. That, that partnership really needs to work well to ensure that victims are protected um, in the future. We also work closely with a lot of partner agencies. A lot of you are online today. Certain powers for police were given during this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we had our own decision-making tree that we had to take into consideration, along with tactical options, policies, procedures, legislation. So there's a lot of information overload for police to take on board on the everyday policing when it comes to domestic violence. Certainly um, custody of defendants came into play um, when it came to having someone in, in the police docks. Um, to do with COVID-19 and ongoing risk assessments to do with social distancing as well. Some of the powers included entering locations during isolation under COVID-19 specific orders. Um, an example would be uh, some people that were um, in isolation at the different hotels around Sydney and then being alerted to a domestic incident that was happening um, in that room itself and then having to enter under certain different powers, obviously being a hotel room and things like this. So we had to be aware of that. Um, during this time, we've taken the opportunity to push some really important things down to police. DVSAT, the importance of updating, of uh, uh, getting an up-to-date phone number um, or an email or an alternative phone number or really gauging and understanding that um, we have to complete a DVSAT assessment. We have to send that through to CRP but the numbers or, or things may have changed because the offender is in such close proximity. So that was taken into, into um, play and, and certainly police ran with that. 
Um, the Men's Telephone Counselling Referral Service is another mandatory pathway that's um, asked of um, men who meet a certain criteria when they're in police custody or at the time of applying for an AVO. Um, I'm not sure if you've all heard of Mobipol, which is a, essentially a Samsung phone device that all police carry upon shift. There's been some enhancements, enhancements which happen to coincide with the COVID-19 pandemic, which allows police to certainly take um, DVSAT on the Mobipol and hand the phone to the victim, enable them to answer the questions, which is less um, confrontational, I guess. Um, it's quite some of those questions, as we know, are a little bit Harry Scary, um, asking from a DV incident. Um, we've also had some um, other enhancements. We can complete ADVO compliance checks, which I'll go into now. Essentially allowing for a more streamlined and faster policing approach, um, not having to return to a police station to enter data entry. We can actually get these things done out on the road, finish with that matter. It's all on the report system and then carry on and answer as many calls as we possibly can as quickly as we can. Um, it's as I said, it's not new, but we, we took this opportunity to promote these tools to police on top of what they were actually um, dealing with. Um, we actually started an interagency meeting with other national police colleagues, which is chaired by ourselves and DJs. Um, these meetings currently have um, gone down to monthly um, once things started to ease off, but that's where we talk about what's happening in your area, what's happening in ours, and we learn from each other. Um, you talked about North Shore specific, was that correct, Adol? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yes. In so I can actually the North Sydney area. Right, so I actually contacted our statistics area to clarify if there was any increase or decrease. And the, the response which came back from at the experts in our area is there's actually been no noticeable increase in calls for police to the North Sydney area or in fact, the overall state, okay, for police. In saying that, we can see that um, that's what in relation to calls and reports we've received. But as we know, and you all know, being the experts in the room, the impact of the pandemic in reality probably isn't reflecting the calls and reports that we've received as we know moving forward. So I think we've worked really hard during this time. I think we really need to continue working just as hard, if not harder in the coming months. And I guess we just also wanted to um, see whether it's possible to track any increase in the call out and, and, and attribute to these, um, to COVID-19. So there's been no significant call outs um, during this COVID-19. Um, I'll start by saying the media reports that have been talking about this point have not been born from police data. In fact, um, police data reflects a minimal change. Um, a small increase has been noted in domestic family violence incidents that involve violence. That's a very small marked increase. And in the interest of statistics, Boxar has actually just, um, they released the report back in April and they talked about um, statistics around the March period of time when the isolation was starting to put restrictions in and, and, and really um, cause a lot of stress for a lot of people. So they were consistent with the same period from 2019. So there was no increase during that time. Um, there's been a Boxar um, released this morning, 10.30 this morning. I'm not sure if any of you have had a chance to have a look at that one. But in the six weeks between the 15th of March and the 26th of April, so that's when there was full lockdown in place, um, it was reported that there were DV assaults um, that were reported to police had declined by 23%. And that was um, consistent with what Boxar had actually predicted. Okay, so um, what measures are possible um, to support women and children who are known to police for uh, risks to their safety, particularly in case of persons being granted bail where sentencing has been postponed? Okay, so as I mentioned in my previous answer, we have what's called apprehended domestic violence um, compliance checks in place. So this is similar to what we had or have in place when it comes to bail. You have a defendant with an AVO who has to abide by certain conditions that have laid out by the courts. Our job is to go and visit that defendant and the protected person, mainly with the focus on the defendant, um, as it's a, to prevent reoffending, um, is to have, have some focus on him or her and say, this is your AVO, these are the conditions you must abide by. And we literally turn up. There's no, by the way, I'm going to come and talk to you. It's we can turn up there. We can see that person in, in the pub, down the street, wherever we feel like it, basically, and say, well, I'm just uh, reminding you, you have an AVO. Um, want to make sure you know of the conditions. And um, this is an apprehended domestic violence um, compliance check. 
and I'm just letting you know I will be talking to the other party as well. And often we've found that um, not necessarily during this particular time of the pandemic, but that's when we find some breaches because we're not reliant on the pin op to give us a call. We just turn up and as you know, gut feelings can often tell you that someone might be inside or gut feelings tell you there might be a little bit more that that pinop may wish to discuss with us. Now, in relation to the Boxar report, it actually noted that during that same six week period or sorry, yet yeah, during April, it reported that there was an 85% increase in ADVO compliance checks by police. So again, we put the focus on this during this time and we amped up our compliance checks. So we were going to places, people's places to see what was going on because we knew they couldn't come to us. So um, that may have something to do with, with the statistics. I'm not sure. I acknowledge that there certainly is um, some underreporting, um, no doubt. Um, we've also got uh, emergency accommodation arrangements in place for defendants who are released on bail from police custody. That is as simple as us calling Link to Home. There was nothing specific in place. So we made arrangements with Link to Home to say, well, look, we can't just kick them out and they can go home. Um, or go to another party. We've got isolation restrictions in place. We need to, to source other locations for them to go. Um, I've just got a few other points here to cover. As Erin um, said from Manly Court, the arrangement's still in place that the um, pinops are excused from that from courts at this time. So the, the, we certainly rely on um, WDV CAS at this moment, um, getting in touch where possible um, to discuss with the, the pinops. Um, and when I say pinops, I'm talking about protected persons and AWO, um, discuss the conditions on AVO and their wishes moving forward and, and discuss any backwards and forwards conversations between police and WDV CAS. Normally that would take place in a court precinct in the safe room. Um, we acknowledge the strong potential that we may receive an increase in reports of DV incidents after the restrictions are eased further. I just encourage all of you to, um, when talking with your clients, um, just um, obviously that period of time was very stressful for everyone and there was, there was, it was sort of a, a Groundhog Day approach every day, the same thing every day. If um, those persons reporting, um, those victims can actually think about ways to recall um, their memory when talking to police. So whether those are significant things that happened that day, just something to prompt them and help them when they do choose to, if they choose to come and report to us, um, all those matters will be investigated thoroughly as they always would be. Um, a couple of community service announcements have been put on our um, internet pages. Um, it's sort of a rehash of previous ones we've used, but certainly with the COVID-19 twist, just reminding people that this time is a stressful time for everyone, but COVID-19 is not going to be an excuse for any abuse. Um, I believe we started trending a hashtag, um, no excuse for abuse, and we we're, we're using that quite a lot on social media. Um, we teamed up with Drinkwise and launched a digital and radio advert campaign regarding alcohol consumption during this time and its links to domestic violence. Um, we're promoting um, support numbers with that. Um, this is a new one which I actually learned this morning. As a result of some of the feedback during these AVO compliance checks, defendants were stating um, comments like we're not sure about the conditions, we're having issue understanding our obligations to comply and also obtaining their property when they've been um, told to vacate uh, a location or not to return due to um, exclusion zones. So as a result of that, our specific domestic and family violence team have put some information sheets together, both for victims and for offenders or defendants um, in relation to their journey through the criminal justice system. Now I've been told that those um, handouts will be available for the public. They'll actually be on our police internet site. If you click through the domestic violence tabs, they'll be readily available and I urge you to use them in your services as well. That's good. Um, I guess our last questions, it's, it's again in relation to ADVO and um, Aaron touched on it earlier on. It's just, um, has there been any changes to the ADVO process initiated by police during the COVID-19 times? Uh, well, during that time, there were some legislated amendments, um, which meant that uh, normally um, the legislation says when we take out an AVO, we must put that AVO before the court within a 28 day period. However, there were some amendments made, I believe it was section 29 of the Act, Crimes Domestic Personal Violence Act that stated, um, in relation to AVOs that had no accompanying charges. If the order had a condition four, which is the alcohol and um, drug prohibition um, to prevent them from um, consuming alcohol and drugs and a condition 10, that 
AVO alone would have a return time of six months in advance. So those conditions were to remain in place for a six month period, obviously keeping people out of the court complex. That didn't negate the fact that a defendant um, or a, a protected person could put in an uh, ap application to vary to the court and bring it forward and have it seen to. But that was the what the um, legislation stated. And when there was AVOs that uh, existed, which had the uh, no contact exclusions, the return date was a three month turnaround. Um, all of those have been lifted. We're back to a 28 day turnaround um, and that started as of Monday, the 15th of June, um, which is the standard legislated time. So basically the first DV mention day or DV list day for every court um, where police are. Um, I've got a couple of other things I wanted to mention to you. Varying of AVOs. Now, again, the two next things I'm going to mention just happen to fall in time when COVID-19 hit. It, it's literally a coincidence, but it's a very positive coincidence. So in relation to varying an ADVO, um, a scenario, a victim um, has an AVO of 1ABC, which is standard conditions, and a further incident happens, and we need to vary that AVO very quickly to ensure that um, offender is excluded from the home. Previously, that would be an application to the court. We would have to wait for the court to grant that and so forth. Um, that has now been changed to allow for police to do an urgent application to vary that AVO at the time of reporting. And as usual with an AVO, once it's served upon a defendant, it's enforced straight away. That legislative change happened during March, which coincided with COVID, um, which I think was a really positive thing to happen. Um, the other thing that uh, happened is the AVO lengths um, of AVOs have been extended. So the standard AVO length when police apply for an AVO is now two years. Um, that's the minimum we start with and we can now increase that to, an, there's actually an indefinite AVO that we can actually request for by the courts. Now, um, I'm talking about in really um, matters um, oh, straight away, I would think of a strangulation matter where the, the victim is, is quite seriously injured and, and obviously, um, you know, not, not well off after that incident. I myself and other police would certainly um, be guided to apply for an indefinite ADVO. Um, and that would obviously be left up to the magistrate to determine at final sentencing of a matter. But th there's different levels of that. Um, so that happened again. To be a, it was a legislative amendment and it just happened to fall in time with this. So um, I think that's a really positive move. Um, and, and that would probably be all the questions I have, Ed, I don't believe. Thank you very much, Alana, for, for the information that you have provided. Now I think we're going to open the floor for questions and um, hand that to you, Maria. Thanks so much, Adam. Uh, in terms of the ADVOs, um, someone has asked, uh, if if an ADVO has lapsed, um, are, is the the child or the victim of the perpetrator has to, do they have to see the perpetrator now, even though the ADVO has lapsed? Can it be put in place again for the child? Um, I guess it would be dependent, as Erin said, whether the lapse occurred because there was a breakdown in communication to the court or court date. So I'd probably get them to to look into that matter first. Um, but if, if an AVO has lapsed completely, then a new AVO needs to be taken out to continue that. Um, and those things we would look at, what's changed, what's the circumstances that have changed. If the threat level and the risk is still there, then there may be grounds to proceed. If there's new incidents to report, then certainly there may be further grounds. But we also need to look at the time that that AVO has been in place. Um, but it, it can't just pick off where it left up, where it can't just pick up where it left off. Thank you. Uh, and a few people have asked about statistics for their local area. Are they able to access that from a police perspective? Uh, but then following on from that, is there, I guess, um, so you're noticing there's not so much difference in the stats in terms of DV currently, but other organisations are noticing changes. Um, what are you noticing with that and how do you think that's playing out? Um, obviously, we respond to calls. So if, if the victim um, or a, a bystander is not calling us, then there's no call for us to go to. I'm not surprised that, that you are being reached, that the services are being contacted. I'm not surprised at all. And as I previously said, 
I myself could likely see an increase in calls. Um, maybe not an influx, but certainly I would suspect some late reporting to be occurring and we all know reasons why that's taken place. Um, in regards to local statistics, that actually falls to the commander of the police area command. So um, it's not a given that we just give out statistics, I guess, and certainly not suburb by suburb. We can look at regions, southern, north, west, and all those sorts of things, but it definitely would fall down to the commander. So I'd, I'd urge those services to contact the DVLO, who could then get in touch with the commander or crime manager and sort that out for them. Thank you very much. Uh, and then there's been a couple of questions on compliance checks. Um, how do you select who do the compliance checks and can caseworkers request or advocate um, on behalf of their clients for the police to go and do a compliance check? Okay, firstly, I'll just answer the chat question that just came up. Yes, Boxar is live on the Boxar website as of 10.25 this morning. It's always a public document. We as police receive it a bit earlier. So I had the stats sitting there waiting to see if it was going to be released to the public and thankfully it was. Um, in relation to ADVO compliance checks, so um, we know statistically that the the rate um, of, of re-offending or breach AVOs occurs within the first three months, typically within the first couple of weeks. So every AVO that police take out um, goes through an assessment period um, from the DVLO and the supervisor above and the OIC themselves to determine the levels of risk, um, the conditions that are there, previous history, sometimes gut feelings. I, I used to go with my gut a lot as well. Um, common knowledge, um, services ring out saying, look, I know this um, only one ABC here, but we're really concerned because Jane Doe has mentioned a few other things to us. And so that, look, there, there is a, a broad reason for what, what we choose as heck, but we do predominantly um, focus on the provisional AVOs that we've taken out. Uh, it doesn't mean we can't do others. Um, and yes, if caseworkers have concerns, I'd urge them to get in touch with the DVLO, raise those concerns, and there's no issue with the DVLO looking that, but I can um, assure you that every AVO we take out does get assessed at the time it's taken out and we have actual teams that go out and do these checks. Um, Southern Region actually just completed an entire region of AVO compliance operation um, where they just flooded the whole region. So it, it, it yeah, we, it, we sort of take it from all sorts of sources and certainly if we've got DVSTMPs appearing on further AVOs then we'd like to go and have a nice chat with them as well. Thanks so much. And one more question for me. Um, is the decrease in reported DV incidents consistent with any decrease in other crimes during COVID-19? Um, there's actually, I'll, I'll probably refer you to the Boxar. So if you go to the Boxar website, the crime trends in most categories have been significantly decreased during this isolation period. And I'll let you have a look at that.